chapter 48. They slowly walked back to camp. The tall man was the Texas Attorney General, the chief law enforcement officer for the state. Stanley's lawyer was named Mrs. Marengo. Stanley held the suitcase. He was so tired he couldn't think straight. He felt as if he were walking into a dream, not quite able to comprehend what was going around him. They stopped in the front of the camp office. Mr. Sir went inside to get Stanley's belongings. The Attorney General told Mr. Pendansky to get the boy something to eat and drink. The warden seemed as dazed as Stanley. You can't even read, Zero, she said to Zero. Zero said nothing. Mrs. Marengo put a hand on Stanley's shoulder and told him to hang in there. He will be seeing his parents soon. She was shorter than Stanley, but somehow gave the appearance of being tall. Mr. Pendansky returned with two cartons of orange juice and two bagels. Stanley drank the juice, but didn't feel like eating anything. Wait, the warden exclaimed. I didn't stay. They stole the suitcase. It's his suitcase, obviously. But he put my things from my cabin inside it. <clears throat> that isn't what you said earlier, said Mrs. Marengo. What's in the suitcase? She asked Stanley. Tell us what's in it, and then, and then we'll open it and see. Stanley didn't know what to do. Stanley, as your lawyer, I advise you not to open your suitcase, said Miss Marengo. He has to open it, said the warden. I have a right to check the personal property of any detainees. How do I know there ain't drugs or weapons in there? He stole a car, too. I've got witnesses. She was nearly hysterical. <clears throat> he is no longer under your jurisdiction, said Stanley's lawyer. He has not been officially released, said the warden. Open the suitcase, Stanley. Don't open it, said Stanley's lawyer. Stanley did nothing. Mr. Sir returned from the office with Stanley's backpack and clothes. The attorney general handed Mrs. Marengo a sheet of paper. You're free to go, he said to Stanley. I know you're anxious to get out of here, but you can just keep the orange suit as a souvenir or burn it, whatever you want. Good luck, Stanley. He reached out his hand to shake. Mrs. Marengo hurried Stanley away. Come on, Stanley, she said. We've got a lot to talk about. Stanley stopped and turned to look at Zero. He couldn't just leave him there. Zero gave him a thumbs up. I can't leave Hector, Stanley said. I suggest we go, said his lawyer with a sense of urgency in her voice. I'll be okay, said Zero. His eyes shifted toward Mr. Pendansky on one side and then the warden and Mr. Sir on the other. There's nothing I can do for your friend, said Miss Marengo. You are released you are released pursuant to an order from the judge. They'll kill him, said Stanley. Your friend is not in danger, said the Attorney General. There's going to be an investigation into everything that's happened here. For the present, I am taking charge of the camp. Come on, Stanley, said his lawyer. Your parents are waiting. Stanley stayed where he was. His lawyer sighed. May I have a look at Hector's file, she asked. Certainly, said the Attorney General. Miss Walker, go get Hector's file. She looked at him blankly. Well... The warden turned to Mr. Pendansky. Bring me Hector Zeroni's file. He stared at her. Get it, she ordered. Mr. Pendansky went into the office. He returned a few minutes later and announced that the file was apparently misplaced. The Attorney General was outraged. What kind of rent camp are you running here, Miss Walker? The warden said nothing. She stared at the suitcase. The Attorney General reassured Stanley's lawyer that he would get the records. Uh, excuse me while I call my office. He turned back to the warden. I assume the phone works? He walked into the camp office, slamming the door behind him. A little while later, he reappeared and told the warden that he wanted to talk to her. She cursed and went inside. Stanley gave Zero a thumbs up. Caveman, is that you? He turned to see Armpit and Squid coming out of the rec room. Squid shouted back into the rec room. Caveman and Zero are here! Soon all the boys from Camp D had gathered around him and Zero. Good to see you, man, Armpit said, shaking his hand. We thought you were buzzard food. Stanley is being released today, said Mr. Pandansky. Way to go, said Magnet, hitting him on the shoulder. And you didn't even have to step on a rattlesnake, said Squid. Even Zigzag shook Stanley's ham, hand. Uh, sorry about, you know. It's cool, said Stanley. We had to lift the truck clear out of the hole, Zigzag told him. It took everybody in C. D and E, and we just picked it right up. It was really cool, said Twitch. X-Ray was the only one who didn't come over. Stanley saw him hanging back 
behind the others a moment and then turned into the rec room. Guess what, said Magnet, glancing at Mr. Pandansky. Mom says we don't have to dig any more holes. That's great, said Stanley. Will you do me a favor? Asked Squid. I guess, Stanley agreed somewhat hesitantly. I want you to... He turned to Miss Marengo. Hey, lady, can I have a pen and paper I can borrow? She gave it to him, and Squid wrote down a phone number which gave, he gave to Stanley. Can you call my mom for me, okay, and tell her, tell her I said I was sorry. Tell her Alan said he was sorry. Stanley promised he would. Now, you be careful out in the real world, said Armpit. Not everybody is as nice as us. Stanley smiled. The boys departed when the warden came out of the office. The attorney general was right behind her. My office is having some difficulty locating Hector Zeroni's records, the attorney general said. So, you have no claim of authority over him? asked Miss Marengo. I didn't say that. He's in the computer. We just can't access his records. It's like they've fallen through a hole in cyberspace. A hole in cyberspace, Miss Marengo repeated. How interesting. When is his release date? I don't know. How long has he been here? Like I said, we can't... So what are you planning to do with him? Keep him confined indefinitely without jurisdiction while you go crawling through your black holes in cyberspace? The attorney general just stared at her. He obviously is incarcerated for a reason. Oh, and what reason was that? The attorney general said nothing. Stanley's lawyer took hold of Zero's, Zero's hand. Come on, Hector. You're coming with us. Chapter 49. They never used to be spot, yellow-spotted lizards in the town of Green Lake. They didn't come to the area until after the lake dried up. But the townsfolk had heard about the red-eyed monsters living in the desert hills. One afternoon, Sam, the onion man, and his donkey, Mary Lou, were returning to his boat, which was anchored just off the little shore. It was late in November, and the peach trees had almost had lost most of their leaves. Sam! Someone called out. He turned around to see three men running after him, waving their hats. He waited. Afternoon, Walter. Bo. Jesse. He greeted them, and they walked up, catching their breath. Oh, glad we caught you. We're, we're going rattlesnake hunting in the morning. We want to get some of your, your lizard juice, said Walter. I ain't scared of no rattlesnake, said Jesse, but I don't want to come across one of those red-eyed monsters. I'd seen one once, and that was enough. I knew about, about the red eyes, of course, but I hadn't heard about the big black teeth. It was the white tongues that got me, said Bo. Sam gave each man two bottles of pure onion juice. He told them to drink one bottle before going to bed that night and half the bottle in the morning and then half the bottle around lunchtime. Are you sure this works? Asked Walter. I tell you what, said Sam. If it doesn't, you can come back to me next week and I'll give you your money back. Walter looked unsure and Bo and Jesse just laughed. And Sam laughed too. Even Mary Lou let out a rare, yeah. Just remember, Sam told the men before they left, it's very important you drink a bottle tonight. You need, you gotta get it into your bloodstream. The lizards don't like onion blood. Zero and Stanley sat in the backseat of Miss Marengo's BMW. The suitcase lay between them. It was locked and they decided to let Stanley's father to try and open it in his workshop. You don't know what's in it, do you? She asked. No, said Stanley. I didn't think so. The air conditioning was on, but they drove with the windows open as well because, no offense, you boys really smell bad. Miss Marengo explained that she was a patent attorney. I'm helping your father with a new product he's invented. He happened to mention your situation, so I did a little investigating. Clyde Livingston's sneakers were stolen sometime between before 315. I found a young man, Derek Dune, who said that at 3.20, you were in the bathroom fishing your notebook out of the toilet. Two girls remember seeing you come out of the boys' restroom carrying a wet notebook. Stanley fed, felt his ears redden. Even after everything he'd been through, the memory still caused him to feel shame. So you couldn't have stolen them, said Miss Marengo. He didn't. I did, said Zero. You did what? asked Miss Marengo. I stole the sneakers. The lawyer actually turned around while driving and looked at him. I didn't hear that, she said, and I advise you to make sure that I don't hear it again. What did my father invent? Stanley asked. Did he find a way to recycle the sneakers? No, he's still working on that, explained Miss Marengo, but he invented a product that eliminates foot odor. Here, I've got a sample in my briefcase. I wish I had more. You too could bathe in it. She opened her briefcase with one hand and passed a small bottle back to Stanley. It had a, it had a fresh and somewhat spicy smell. He handed it to Zero. What is it called? Stanley asked. We haven't come up with a name yet, said Miss Marengo. 
It smells familiar, said Zero. Peaches, right? asked Miss Marengo. That's what everyone says. A short while later, both the boys fell asleep. Behind them, the sky, the sky had turned dark, and for the first time in over a hundred years, a drop of rain fell into the empty lake. All right. Part three, filling in holes, chapter 50. Stanley's mother insists that they were there was never a curse. She even doubts whether Stanley's great-great-grandfather really stole a pig. The reader might find it interesting, however, that Stanley's father invented his cure for foot odor the day after the great-great-grandson of Mr. Elia Yelnats carried the great-great-great-grandson of Madden Zeroni up the mountain. The Attorney General closed Camp Green Lake. Miss Walker, who was in desperate need of money, had to sell the land, which had been in her family for generations. It was bought by a national organization dedicated to the well-being of young girls. In a few years, Camp Green Lake will become a Girl Scout camp. This is pretty much the end of the story. The reader probably still has some questions, but unfortunately from here on in, the answers tend to be long and tedious. While Mrs. Bell, Stanley's former math teacher, might want you to know the percentage change in Stanley's weight, the reader probably cares more about the change in Stanley's character and self-confidence. But those changes are subtle and hard to measure. There's simply no answer. Even the contents of the suitcase turned out to be somewhat tedious. Stanley's father pried it open in his workshop, and at first everyone gasped at the sparkling jewels. Stanley thought he and Hector had become millionaires, but the jewels were of poor quality and worth no more than $20,000. Underneath a stack of jewels was a stack of papers that had once belonged to the first Stanley Yelnet. They consisted of stock certificates, deeds of trust, and promissory notes. They were hard to read and even more difficult to understand. Miss Marengo's law firm spent more than two months going through all the papers. They had turned out to be a lot more valuable than the jewels. After legal fees and taxes, Stanley and Zero each received less than a million dollars, but not a lot less. It was enough for Stanley to buy his family a new house with a laboratory in the basement and Hector to hire a team of private investigators. But it would be boring to go through all the tedious details with all the changes in their lives. Instead, the reader will be presented with one last scene, which took place almost one year and a half after Stanley and Hector left Camp Green Lake. You will have to fill in the holes yourself. There was a small party at the Yelnats' house. Except for Stanley and Hector, everyone there was an adult. All kinds of snacks and drinks were set out on the counter, including caviar, champagne, and the fixings to make an ice cream sundae. The Super Bowl was on television, but nobody was really watching. It should be coming on after the break, Miss Marengo announced. A timeout was called in the football game, and a commercial came on the screen. Everyone stopped talking and watched. The commercial showed up at a baseball game. Amid a cloud of dust, Clyde Livingston slid into home plate as the catcher caught the ball and tried to take him out. Safe, shouted the umpire as he signaled with his arms. The people at Stanley's house cheered as if it really counted. Clyde Livingston got up and dusted the dirt off his uniform. As he made his way back to the dugout, he spoke to the camera. Hi, I'm Clyde Livingston, but everyone here around calls me Sweet Feet. Way to go, Sweet Feet, said another baseball player slapping his hand. Besides being on the television screen, Clyde Livingston was also sitting on the couch next to Stanley. But my feet weren't always sweet, the television Clyde Livingston said as he sat on the dugout bench. They used to smell so bad that nobody would sit near me in the dugout. They really did stink, said a woman sitting on the couch on the other side of Clyde. She held her nose with one hand and fanned the air with the other. Clyde shushed her. Then a teammate told me about sploosh, said the television Clyde. He pulled a can of sploosh out from under the dugout bench and held it for everyone to see. I just spray a little on each foot every morning, and now I really have sweet feet. Plus, I like the tingle. Sploosh, said a voice. A treat for your feet, made with all natural ingredients. It neutralizes odor-causing fungi and bacteria. Plus, you like the tingle. Everyone at the party clapped their hands. He wasn't lying, said the woman who sat next to Clyde. I couldn't even be in the same room with his socks. The other people at the party laughed. The woman continued, I'm not joking. It was so bad. You made your point, said Clyde, covering her mouth with his hand. He looked back at Stanley. Will you do me a favor, Stanley? Stanley raised and lowered his left shoulder. I'm going to get more caviar, said Clyde. Keep your hand over my wife's mouth. He patted Stanley on his shoulder and rose from the couch. Stanley looked uncertainly at his hand and then at Clyde Livingston's wife. She winked at him. 
He felt himself blush and turned away toward Hector, who was sitting on the floor in front of the overstuffed chair. A woman sitting in the chair behind Hector was absently minding fluffing his hair with her fingers. She wasn't very old, but her skin had, looked weathered, had a weathered look to it, almost like leather. Her eyes seemed weary, as if she had seen too many things in her life but she didn't, that she didn't want to see. And when she smiled, her mouth seemed too big for her face. Very softly, she sang, half sang, half hummed, a song that her grandmother used to sing to her when she was a little girl. If only, if only the moon speaks no reply, reflecting the sun and all that's gone by. By strong, my weary wolf, turn around boldly, fly high, my baby bird, my angel, my only.